I'm Alec. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about kind of this idea. And I don't want to say that this is like the most revolutionary idea that's ever happened in all of JavaScript. But I definitely think it's something that's not really done today that could help a lot if it was done more, particularly on um, web pages uh, and in the DOM. So but before I get started, uh, like I said, my name is Alec. And I'm kind of creepily passionate about JavaScript. So work with me. I think it's really exciting. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it right after I move to the next slide. OK, so um, I don't want to go all Douglas Crackford here, but one thing that I see a lot, and I definitely view the source of pages probably a little bit um, more than I should, is this whole, like, we're going to namespace between multiple files by, like, moving um, an object into the global scope and then, like, doing run, like, runtime binding later. So we're going to set properties on that object, and then we're going to try to get them later, and we're going to hope that by the time we go to get them that everything is initialized, or we're going to use a library like require.js to kind of make sure that that happens for us. Um, but there's something I don't like about this structure, and obviously, since what I like determines the universe, everyone should change. Um, it leaves things that are important kind of out in the world for everyone to touch and modify. So if, by chance, someone were to open up the console or uh, a malicious hacker were to find a way to inject code into the page, it's really trivial to just change something. Um, and it, at first, it seems like there's not a lot you can do to prevent this. I mean, after all, it's not like you can make your code special and run with special rights. I mean, part of having them run in the console or putting their code on your page is that it's running the same way that your page would. Um, but it turns out that because of the way JavaScript is um, written, particularly the way it uses closure, that it's possible to make a lot of this a little bit more um, actually impossible to do, in a sense. So if we just rewrite this in a slightly different way, um, inside of just a self-invoking anonymous lambda function, we can actually take advantage of the fact that this function will still have access to this variable, even though um, the outer function has returned, and then later reference that um, in the global scope. Uh, just a quick plug, the other thing I really like about this is it's very easy to copy and paste. So when we were um, setting an object in the global scope, we kind of have to worry about conflict. But with something like this, you could literally cut and paste this section of code and move it inside of another self-invoking Lambda function and almost like do, I don't know, like modules within your modules kind of inception here. Um, but uh, not going to go all Douglas Crackford. So I wanted to take this kind of the next step. And so I came up with this idea that I'm calling right now signed hash.js. I'm going to open source it eventually, uh, not quite at that phase yet, and probably change the name. So the way it works is um, it's designed for single page applications uh, that are primarily JavaScript driven. And the idea is, is that the user does authentication through a post request, ideally on a separate page, was kind of the way I envisioned it. So they log in, they post, and then um, the server serves a page. The idea here is that the only way to get the server to serve that exact same page would be to repost the username and password of the user whom we're trying to authenticate. Um, so on that page, the server includes a token tag and populates it with a token of some kind that's unique to the session of that particular user. Later, um, at the top of the page, so the token should be ideally like the first thing in the page, maybe after the doc type just to you know, keep things you know, compliant, but definitely before um, any like something uh, dynamic is being written to the page to minimize that XXS. There should be the token tag and some initial JavaScript that reads the token out of that tag, stores it within a closure, and then destroys that, um, that DOM object. And so in this way, later uh, code that were to run on the page would not be able to access that token. Because again, the only way that you'd be able to do like an XHR thing would be to have the password of the user. So I mean, I'm not sure how you defend against that if they have the password. Um, don't ask me that. Um, uh, but the reality is, is that it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that because just having a way to like store a token and using that when you're, you're sending requests to the server isn't that great because it turns out that like everything in JavaScript is a prototype um, and those can all be overwritten. <laughs> so like you think you can trust the fact that you're getting a substring or that you're, um, I don't know, pushing something onto the end of an array, but you really can't. It's, it's actually very trivial to overwrite those or to, I forget the buzzword, duck punching, duck punching to override them and then maintain a reference to the original, manipulate the, um, the content conditionally. So um, yeah, so, and then the other thing to think about is, is suppose that we had a method that did some like super secret thing that we wanted to make absolutely sure this method did. If that method is still exposed into the global scope or like an on-click handler on a button, well, the attacker can just call that method. 
So I mean, how, how much more secure is this? And so um, I've set up, this should be my IP address, assuming my network context has not changed, which that's like as of five minutes ago. Um, if you have like a laptop, you can look at it. I have a demo page in which I have placed an application, um, and I'll show you. And so the idea here is, is this is functioning as the login to the application. Uh, so you could, it's really simple, you could just choose a secret. It's very secretive. And now that's been shared with the server via a post request. And now the JavaScript on this page has created a button, and when I click it, the server just echoes back the secret. Not that exciting, I know. And that's my presentation, a button that displays the same thing you typed in. Uh, no, I want to talk a little bit about what's going on here. So, um, so you can see here there's like a token. Maybe you can't see here. I'm assuming you can. I'm also assuming I can use my computer. OK. So in this tag, there was originally a token, but that's been removed by some JavaScript, which I have here. Oh, it's too bad I can't get that bigger. Can you kind of read that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's not even the right JavaScript. This JavaScript, it's right here. OK, cool. So you can kind of see um, my pattern. I have declared something, the signed hash constructor, into the, um, it, in this case, it's the global scope, but whatever the encapsulating scope happens to be at the time. And the first thing I did was I got that secret, and I stored it safely within my closure and removed it from the DOM. And now here's where things get a little bit um, sketchy. Because I'm going to be doing operations with the secret and some of those operations necessarily involve built-in library functions, I have to maintain references to the original copies of those functions so that I can trust the computations that I do later. So you can see here that I maintain um, references to the object define property, object create, object freeze, type pair. I don't have to list them. And then later I've created this special function called validate environment, again encapsulated within my anonymous lambda, that verifies those. So if you were to call that function and something had changed in kind of a sketchy way, it would just um, basically the outer function, which I'll get to in a moment, would fail so that an attacker can't use it. Um, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about what this actually does. So the idea of the signed hash is that anywhere uh, you can create one, anywhere in the script, and you can set properties on it. But in the process of setting properties, a copy of the source of every function in the stack at the time of the property set and additional information about the environment, um, you could choose that information, ideally. Uh, it would be application specific. But in this case, it's, um, it's like the, the CSS surrounding the button. Like, is someone trying to hide this button or have additional styles beyond what was in the style sheets been applied? Something that I don't know about. And if any of those things are true, um, the server will ultimately know about it when the request is finally submitted. So, uh, that pretty much sums up the basic idea, I think. So there's this object. You can set properties on it. In the end, it gets serialized to JSON, but the JSON is signed by a function that has the token. And then that's submitted to the server. So the server knows, without a doubt, that the function, that it is assigned, um, it's assigned hash because of the token and everything. So it provides a secure way to communicate with the server, even if you can't necessarily the trust the code that's running on the page or the styles that are being applied to the page which is um, kind of crazy. So the way I went about um, implementing this, uh, oh, this is kind of important too. It's really tempting, and I've definitely made this mistake in the past, to like declare like a signed hash function um, on the outside of the scope and then immediately reference it within my own anonymous function. But that doesn't protect me from the case that someone sets it outside of my, anon my anonymous function. Um, and then later, if I'm using that internally, that can cause problems. So again, I've kind of prefixed an underscore thing and kept a reference just for my own safekeeping. Um, Object.create is kind of new. It's in ECMA 5, um, which is supported in every major browser. Um, I don't know, do I, do I need to explain it? Or is everybody, everybody's familiar with JavaScript? Okay, cool. So um, this is kind of a weird thing, and actually, in hindsight, I could have done this way better, but it's kind of too late now. So what I did was I wanted a way to set properties on an object um, without, like, how do I say this? I wanted to leverage the availability of the prototype of the object, because I don't want to create a new type of like, function every time I'm um, creating this individual object. But I still want to have the closure um, of all my variables, and I want to have it in such a way so that I can trust every object in that prototype. So the way I ended up resolving this was is I have a, inside of my function, I have a single Boolean unlocked. And right now it's false. 
And then I have these special properties that are getters that basically only allow me to access um, those properties. Again, those were declared on that object if I set that to true, which I do in all my service functions. So I'll get to that next. So then I have these two functions, uh, get data handle, get log handle, and they get those objects respectively. They take in the signature object and they, since JavaScript is single threaded, I don't have to worry about anything dangerous going on here. It unlocks it, gets the value, and relocks it. And I should probably also check the type. That's a security vulnerability. Oh well. So, um, <laughs> so you, um, let me see here. Yeah, so then I just do a prototype. I made sure I didn't inherit anything because, I don't know, it just seemed kind of sketchy. And so, unfortunately, we don't get the proxy objects until ECMA 6, which sucks because that would have been really handy right now. So the only way I can really have a universal getter and setter um, without a method missing is to do like a set and get function, which is kind of sketchy, but um, work with me, please. So. Uh, basically, the set function lets you set and get properties of the object. Um, I have a simple SHA-1 implementation that I copied and pasted and made sure that its dependencies were protected internally. Um, and then finally, I have this special function that signs the hash and um, leaves it as a string. So um, yeah, and then I have something to kind of crawl the stack and serialize the sources in such a way so that if you're coming from different browsers, like I had this issue where Safari was using like tabs and Chrome was using spaces and then the hashes were different. And it was really frustrating. And since everybody's using semicolons anyway, we can just remove all white space. So um, yeah, that was my thought process there. And then this is just a function that would never actually be left there. I just wanted the ability to um, check out the token to see what it was um, while I was servicing. You would remove that in actual implementation. Anyway, so back to the button. Um, so you click it, and all that's being outputted here is the server's response. So to show you kind of the, um, the power of this, if you will, I'm going to go ahead and try to programmatically click the button. See, that's the button. And when I try to programmatically click it, the server is going to know that something went wrong. Um, in this case, I have it with very verbose things. Again, in like a production environment, you wouldn't want to send the actual source of every function every time you made a request. You would just want to send you know, the hash of the function. But in this case, the server goes, hey, um, so there was this function in the stack that I'm not really sure where that came from. And it refuses to do the request. And so that's kind of the, the brief demonstration of how this could be applied. Uh, again, it could, it could be extended. Um, there's a lot of things you could do uh, as far as like getting user input or outputting it. Obviously, in this case, I'm using window.alert shamelessly. Someone could easily overwrite that. Um, but again, you can verify styles. You have a secured communication with your server. And your server knows that it's your code that's running on the other end of the wire before it dishes out any potentially <coughs> secret information. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Does anyone? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, definitely. Right after I find it. <laughs> we have smaller screen resolutions here. Um, it's here, I promise. Yeah, so um, a small disclaimer. I am not by any means part of this code. Don't judge me. I threw it together really quickly in PHP, which I feel like is an exceptionally bad combination. So um, yeah, so here you can kind of see this is just the index page, which you know what, you don't care about that. Let me show you the actual meaty stuff. This is the part that checks whether or not the code that's being signed is in fact valid. OK, so um, a brief disclaimer about the top. In a production environment, uh, you'd want to incorporate that into like, I immediately think Rails, but like the asset pipeline. As long as you're processing the JavaScript anyway, you can hash all of those functions. It's not like the way I did this was trial and error. I was like, oh, that function isn't known. Add it. You know what I mean? But in reality, there would be ways to not do that. Uh, so I have several functions. I have several jQuery functions that I've allowed. I have the log stack, an internal get method from within the library itself, and then the button click event handler. Um, and I've required my click event handler to be in that stack. So I don't know, if someone attaches like another click event and tries to use the same routines, I would know because I'd be like, hey, um, my verifying function wasn't there, so I can't trust that this request is valid. And then, um, yeah, so it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Basically, it just it sends a JSON object, which has two keys. It has a signature and the, um, the 
another string that's basically JSON. So basically, if you take the string that's the JSON plus the token, SHA-1 hash it, you should get back the signature. And if you don't, you know that something was up, so you don't service that request. Um, assuming you do, you then open up the actual JSON object. You look at it has a data key, which is what was actually on the um, signed hash. So you can look at what was inside of that. And it has a log key, which shows you every function that accessed it, and optionally the source of every function that accessed it. And from there, you just iterate through and make sure that it was uh, the state that you expected. So when, when you do a function call from the client side, are you sending over the signature, or is that getting rehashed on the server to verify? It's, it's all being rehashed. The signature, actually, in addition, it's being salted with a use count. So you can't like send the same thing twice. So you can't like replay the same signed hash string to the <coughs> server and expect it to get the same result. So what I'm saying is, you so, so when it comes to the server, right. what are you checking on the server side? You're just checking for the hash to make sure. It's yeah, I'm, I'm making sure the signature matches um, the data and the token that I sent to the. Remember, because only that special encapsulated function that I trust to verify the content has access to that original token. I'm verifying that the information that it sent me and that token, in fact, matches the signature that it said it did. Because if, you know, if an arbitrary function were to try to do that, it would have no way to access the token and therefore no way to know what that hash should be. Did that answer your question? What I'm asking is, what are you, are you <laughs> looking at post request parameters, or are you rehashing the data that comes back? Because what's to stop somebody from, oh, from no, making I, no, it? There's it only one there. post parameter. It's a JSON object, which is a terrible way to do it. I should have sent that as post body, but again, I was working in PHP, and it was really easy to just have a post variable. So you're taking the, the JSON on the server, looking at it, hashing it? Plus the token. Plus the token. Yeah. So you got a token and a JSON object. Yep, hashed. On the server, and then yes. checking your, your list of keys. Um, you're no. It to your list of I, keys, right? That's what you were showing us up there with the hashes? Yeah, no. OK, so there, there's two stages to this process. The yeah. first stage is verifying that the part, OK, I probably should have explained this better. So I'm going to start with stage one. Yeah. So stage one does like absolutely nothing as far as security. Uh, it just makes sure that a function that I wrote um, actually generated this object. So the way that would work is, um, you would pass it an object. It would get the JSON string representing that object. It has the secret token. And it hashes the JSON string plus the token, produces a new JSON object that has the JSON string from the first object and the signature. And then the server can tell right away whether or not it was that function that, in fact, encoded that piece of information, um, what I'm calling a frame, yeah. just kind of internally a frame. It can tell whether or not that frame actually came from that piece of code by doing the exact same process and seeing if they get the same signature. Because other code on the page would have had no way to know the token. Oh, OK, that's the thing. The token's, the token's hidden from other code. Yeah, okay. and, and, and I mean, I don't know if it's, it's hidden. It's just inside of a Lambda function. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like a super magical thing. It's just, I mean. What happens if you, you source the original page? Well, you can't. Uh, in Chrome, at least, it'll, well, I can do it. I'll show you. Because it'll want to do the post request again, and you'll get a different token. Um, if you were to try to make an XHR request again, you would, again, need the original post data, the person's username and password, if this was implemented in the way in which I'm thinking. But all of that's coming to the client anyways. If they're, if they're scanning for that anyways, wouldn't they be able to pull the token out? The original yeah, post. Right. Is good. Yeah. Right. And, and that, was, that was why I stressed at the beginning, this would need to go at the top of the page before any dynamic content. Can you go to the network tab? When you're yeah, the definitely. And if you go to the local host there, that first entry, and the response. It is. Okay. But I mean, I, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know of any programmatic way to access the original state of the DOM. Um, you could get enter HTML, but again, that's going to go through the DOM tree. So if and the user was logged in, they could get that token and run arbitrary JavaScript on their own. Right. Oh, I see what you're saying. Token. Yeah. The injected code. Right. The, the yeah. The goal is the well, injected so code. So you look at like Cox Communications, they're injecting stuff in my page sometimes to say, hey, I got this new benefit for you. What's to stop someone else from injecting? Coming down the stream, they're injecting it. It's not after the page loads. It's actually in the stream. So what's to stop somebody from yeah, pulling that's, it? Right. It's a really dirty thing that ISPs do that yeah. they're talking 
Hotels. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess I'm not saying I'm solving every security problem that ever existed, but I think this eliminates a large subset of accidental errors that occur where you're not sanitizing information. Provided that you put this code before the area in which the dynamic content is placed, even if you don't sanitize it, theoretically, they still wouldn't be able to impersonate user actions on the site, even though they're in the same context as the page itself. Yeah, I think um, eval. I'm not sure the implementation, but I think Firefox, you can actually pass it a private scope um, to expose variables inside of private scope. Interesting. Um, you might want to look into that. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, that sucks. <laughs> Eval bites again. <laughs> I think it's a great idea. Just I wouldn't market it as a security thing, more as a, what you're saying, to prevent, prevent unintentional things happening. Well, but I mean, those unintentional things are inherently security risks. I mean, it's not like you have unsanitized user content that accidentally calls the delete the account button. <laughs> I mean, I understand what you're saying. I, 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 but my, my goal was um, a subset. I, again, I, I don't want to advertise it as I'm solving all security-based problems in JavaScript and page injection, but I think this eliminates a large subset. Yeah, this kind of reminds me of, uh, I can't remember what the project name it was, but Yahoo made something to you. Um, very similar to this, to sort of wrap around third-party widgets that they'd insert onto their page. Yeah, I actually I know what you're talking about. I can't remember the name either. Yeah, except what I th if we're talking about the same thing, which I can't remember the name either. So let's just talk about something abstractly. Um, it was a it was actually a, a parser that would look through the AST and decide whether or not something should be allowed to be there or not, and mangle the variables. Um, so and then. There was, like, FBML is one that I can remember, I believe was based on that. Um, and the way it works, or used to work, was in addition to mangling the variables and refactoring the syntax tree so that nothing could get to the global scope, it would override certain um, internal methods within JavaScript that would return the global scope and also, like, put weird um, inner functions that would check if things were the global scope and not allow them, so, like, even at runtime, not allow them to run. I think the one that you're thinking of um, is, is by Douglas Crockford himself, and it, I think it's AdSafe. It's suddenly coming to me. It's like the subset of JavaScript. I can try to briefly pull this out of my butt. Um, oh, we don't have to look at Right. But, yeah. That's my idea.